Amen. Praise and glory to God. I want to invite you in your copy of God's Word to turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. If you're making use of that pew Bible there in front of you, we're still on page 1161. For the last several weeks, we have been walking through the book of Philippians together, learning more about what it means for us as a church to be united and focused on moving the gospel forward and really being partners together in the gospel ministry. We're going to continue that conversation this morning, beginning in chapter 1, verse 27. And really, this marks a, a key transition in the letter to Philippians. Prior to this moment, what we have seen is Paul has spent a great deal of time talking about himself. Up until this point, Paul has been really communicating what has been happening in his life and really updating the church in Philippi. Now, that may sound somewhat odd, but let me remind you that this is a letter written to the church in Philippi. And just like we do in our modern conversations, whether that be over the phone or via text, we generally spend the first portion of our conversation updating one another about what's happening in our life. And then we proceed with the reason for calling. That is, in fact, what Paul is doing. He has spent the first first portion of this letter really updating the church on what is happening in his life. And now he is going to begin speaking into the life of the church. Paul holds a unique position as an apostle of the church. And as such, he has authority by which the church would obey and follow his guidance. So starting here in verse 27 and throughout, Paul not only speaks a word to the church at Philippi, but he begins to speak a word of instruction to us here at first, as well as in our individual lives as we follow Christ. Pick back up with me in the letter of Philippians chapter 1, and verse 27, as Paul continues to speak to us, he says, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or whether I hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you were going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have." Paul makes this transition for us in verse 27 by saying, whatever happens. Now, let me remind you that Paul is writing from a position of being persecuted for preaching the gospel. He finds himself under house arrest in Rome, and he is presently awaiting a verdict that will determine either his life or his death. Paul is awaiting to hear what his fate will be. And if you were with us last week, we understand that Paul is at peace with this circumstance in life. He boldly proclaimed earlier here in chapter one, whether he lives or whether he dies, all that matters to him is that Christ would be glorified. And so Paul is making this transition to, for us in verse 27 by saying, whatever happens. Now, a way for us to make that connection would be to understand Paul is writing, whatever happens to me, whether I live or whether I die, whatever happens to me, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of God. Christ. Let's all remember that earlier in chapter 1, back in verse 19, the church at Philippi had specifically been in commitment of prayer for Paul. They have been earnestly praying individually and collectively as a church that Paul would be delivered from his imprisonment, that he would be spared of life, and that he would be able to go on preaching the gospel and hopefully one day return to be a part of their very own church. And so Paul, although confident whether he lives or whether he dies, he will glorify Christ. 
Paul is beginning to prepare the church for the eventuality that he may not come to see them. And so he says to them, whatever happens, whether I live, whether I die, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let me just take a moment here before we proceed any further, and let me just take a moment and think with, together with you about times in our very own lives, like the church at Philippi, when we have earnestly prayed when we have sought God through great trial, through tears, through great fervent prayer, and we have pleaded with God Almighty for the deliverance and freedom of someone that we dearly love. Maybe that individual's been suffering with a terminal illness, and night after night, you pour out your heart and mind in prayer to God, praying that he would deliver them. Maybe that's that God would make some sort of provision in your life by which you could have freedom from some besetting sin that is just entangled in your flesh and you've cried out to God night after night, Lord, give me freedom from this sin. We can relate certainly with the earnest prayers of the church. And there are times in all of our lives, I am certain, when we have seen God miraculously move, when we have seen God perform the miracle, when he's brought the healing, when he's delivered someone who's enslaved, we have experienced, we can testify in God's word and also in our own relationship with God that he is a miracle working God. And there are moments when he brings the deliverance and he gives us great freedom. But then there are also moments where God's response to our earnest and fervent prayers are not what we anticipated. He answers those prayers by calling our loved one home to heaven. He answers those prayers by continuing to press into our faith that we would lean upon our faith in Christ. We have all had the same experience where we have prayed earnestly and yet God's answer has maybe not been what we expected. Paul is preparing the church for this eventuality. Whatever happens to me, whether I live and come to see you, or whether I die and I'm called into glory, whatever happens to me, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Now I need to qualify something with you for a moment that's spoken of here in our text. He says that we are to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Now let's all be assured and very clear here that none of us are ever worthy of the gospel. None of us are ever going to live in such a way that we are going to earn our right into heaven. In fact, the truth of the gospel is that none of us are worthy. Scripture says that we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And that the penalty for that sin or the wages of that sin is death. That is that we would be separated from God. We are never worthy of the gospel. But the good news of Jesus Christ is that God has loved us in such a way that he has given his one and only son who we know as Jesus the Christ. And Jesus has come and he has lived amongst us. And unlike us, he has lived a perfect and sinless life. And out of obedience to God the Father, he died upon the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And we receive new life through faith in Christ. We are never worthy of the gospel. The gospel is a gift of God that is given unto us. Rather, what Paul is saying unto us is that regardless of what happens to him, regardless of the circumstances that we face in our lives, that we would live a life, that is, that we would reflect a life that is worthy of the gospel. We are never working towards salvation, but we are always, as Christians and as followers of Christ, working from a place of being saved. Think about this with me for a moment. When you place your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are forgiven of your sins. You are adopted into the family of God. All of the promises of Scripture become yours as they are fulfilled in Christ Jesus. 
You are given an eternal place, a resting in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. All of these things are yours. And as we meditate on all that we inherit from God through Jesus Christ, it should change how we live. It should change how we respond to our circumstances. It should give us the opportunity in faith to say, whatever happens to me, whether in life or death, I will live a life that honors and glorifies God. That is what the Apostle Paul is encouraging the church to do. Whether I live or whether I die, whether I come to see you again or whether I will never be in your presence again, whatever happens to me, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have said to many uh, others, and I'll continue to say it in my ministry, when we come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, it, it doesn't make us better. It doesn't make us better than someone else. It doesn't make us better than someone who doesn't know Jesus. But when we come to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, it makes us different. It changes the way we live our life. It changes the way we respond to the things that are happening in this world. It changes the way that we respond to the things that happen in our family and in our friends and in our community's lives. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the encouragement that Paul has for the church. And he gives two sets of instructions with that. He goes on at the end of verse 27 to say, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Two points of instruction he gives us here in living a life that is worthy of the gospel. The first is that he says that we would stand firm in one spirit. And the second is that we would strive together as one for the faith of the gospel. The first is that we would stand firm in one spirit. Now, some of your translations will use a lowercase s for the word spirit. But let me assure you that we are to understand here that what Paul is referencing is none other than the Holy Spirit. We know that when we profess faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, it tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 that the Holy Spirit of God comes and indwells in us. That he marks and seals our hearts until the day of redemption. And so Paul's encouragement is that we would stand firm, not in our own power, not in our own strength, but that we would stand firm in the one Spirit, that we would stand firm in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit who lives in us. I am so thankful that God has made a provision for you and I in our faith to give us the power to stand to give us the power to endure, to give us the power to face opposition, to give us the power to walk through challenging circumstances of life. We are not to do it on our own, but we are to stand firm in the power of the Spirit. The second instruction is that we are to strive together as one for the faith of the gospel. That is, we are to understand the the image of an athletic team or a small company of soldiers. They train together, they fight together. They practice together, they play together. We are to strive together. We are to draw strength not only from the Spirit, but as we stand shoulder to shoulder for the gospel message, as we stand together through whatever comes our way, we find the strength that we need to stand firm. But notice he says in verse 28, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Whatever happens, we are to live a life that is worthy of the gospel message, standing firm in the one spirit and together, no matter what happens happens, no matter what comes our way, without being frightened. That word frightened means to be startled or to be spooked. 
When I was in high school, I had the opportunity to do high school rodeo. Now, I need to tell you, I did not grow up on a farm. I did not grow up around cows. I could not tell you anything about a horse, but the opportunity arose for me to do high school rodeo and do some level of competition. But the horse that that I had inherited was what we would call green broke. And that means that they're calm just enough for you to sit on their back but they're not the most reliable uh, animal for competition. And my poor parents saw more of that horse running into the arena than they ever saw me on the back of that horse. This horse had a tendency to be frightened. At every little thing, if the wind blew too strongly from the wrong direction, she would spook and over I would go. If there was a tall tuft of grass at the entrance of the arena that bristled as she ran in, she would jump and over I would go. We're not to be frightened. We're not to be easily spooked. He says we are to stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the face of the gospel without being frightened, without being spooked in any way by those who oppose you. Do you know why we are not to be frightened? We are, we are not to be frightened both by those who oppose us because we win. We are not to be frightened by those who oppose us because we've read the end of the book. We know how this story ends. We know that Christ comes and he redeems and he reigns. We know that we win, that God is on our side and as long as we are moving forward in confidence with God in step together in one spirit, we win. Would you turn to your neighbor this morning and say the victory is ours? Turn to your neighbor. Now, I want you to turn to your neighbor again, and I want you to say the victory is ours, but I want you to say it about 10 times louder this time. Are you ready? Turn to your neighbor. The victory is ours. We are not to be frightened at those who oppose us because we have a God who has won. When Christ Jesus came and died upon the cross for our forgiveness of sins, he was buried in the grave. But three days later, the power of God raised him to newness of life, and the same power, the same power that raised Jesus is the power that lives in you. We are not to be frightened at those who oppose us because we win. We win. One of the saddest realities for the church right now, and I don't mean First Baptist, I mean the church as a whole, is that we have lost our confidence. We have become timid, we've become apologetic, We have lost the confidence that we win. We've lost the confidence that the Holy Spirit gives us. We've lost the confidence that Jesus reigns. And we've become a timid church who has stepped back from our world. But truthfully, as Scripture teaches us and as Paul is encouraging us, we are not to be frightened by those who oppose us. And listen why. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved. Your confidence, our confidence that Jesus wins, our confidence in the assurance that we are saved, our confidence that Jesus has been raised, our confidence in the gospel is a sign to them them that they will be destroyed. Our confidence brings about conviction in their lives and brings about the opportunity for the gospel. We live in a time right now when so many people would love to have confidence. Everything in our world has gotten so confusing Some of the very things that we take as as truth and we take as fact and we take as absolute have gotten so blurred in our world that people don't even know what to think about themselves anymore. But if we will have the confidence of the gospel, if we will have the truth of Jesus Christ, it will be a sign to them 
They will see our confidence and it will draw them unto God. Church, we have to stop being so timid. We need to regain our confidence. We don't need to be mean. We don't need to be ugly. But we do need to stand firm in the truth and the power of the Spirit and with one another that we win that the victory is ours. And as we stand firm, it will be a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. Make no mistake, all of this is happening in the power of God. Now, I wish that we could stop at verse 28 and we didn't have to pick up verse 29. I wish I could leave us as a church on that high note with that message. But, but look at what verse 29 says. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. We've talked a great deal in our study of Philippians about the persecution that Paul has endured But please understand in verse 30, we understand that the church at Philippi is also beginning to endure some level of persecution. And so he says unto them in verse 29, for it has been granted to you, that is, it has been given to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, that is, faith is a gift, that God has opened their eyes, God has softened their heart, and they have come to a saving knowledge that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior, and that is a gift. And I assure you that God wants to give you that gift this morning. And that if you will reach out in faith, you can receive that gift. And just as it has been granted to myself and others, it can be granted unto you. But he goes on and says, it has also been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe, but also to suffer for him. This sounds so strange and odd, but we need, to under, we need to expect and anticipate some level of persecution. We need to expect and anticipate that when we stand firm in the power of the Spirit and when we stand together, there will be a level of opposition And we need to recognize that that opposition doesn't come from the world. It comes from the enemy himself. When we stand boldly in the power of the gospel and we begin to advance the gospel in our lives and in our community, please understand the enemy will take note. And he will do everything in his power to stop the advance of the gospel. He will push us back and he will come against us. And he will attempt to get the church to move the gospel back to the forefront, to sit and be content. We must expect some level of opposition. But in the power of the Spirit, standing together shoulder to shoulder with the advancement of the gospel, our victory is sure. There's a verse of scripture that we don't quote very often to one another. It's one I I doubt many of us have memorized. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And it's in verse 12, and God's word says this. He says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He didn't say might be. He didn't say maybe. Maybe. He said, will be. Church, we must anticipate that as we stand on the word of truth and as we live a godly life, as we live a life that is worthy of the gospel, that it reflects the confidence of the power of the Holy Spirit, we must understand that we will face persecution. But that persecution is not God's withdrawing of his hand. That persecution is not a loss of God's favor. When we study the word and we look at the church as it has been persecuted, and we look at the disciples and other believers as they are persecuted, what we see is not that God has removed his hand or that they have lost favor, but what we see is that they have in fact found favor with God. One of the best examples that I want to encourage you to read sometimes this afternoon comes from the book of Acts chapter 5. 
The early church is is very quickly persecuted for the proclamation of the gospel. The believers are arrested, they're taken to jail, and they're beaten under the punishment of death should they continue to preach the gospel. But in Acts chapter 5, they are released from jail with with the words to never go out and preach again. And as they are walking away from prison, they say to one another, with great joy and with great song that they were worthy to be persecuted for the sake of the gospel. They walk away from their persecution rejoicing. Church, as we stand firm in the power of the Spirit, and as we stand together confident of the truth that God has shared with us, we will be persecuted, but we should count it as joy. And as we stand together in confidence, that confidence becomes infectious. That confidence brings conviction. That confidence not only spurs one another forward, but the community around us will take note. The community around us will see that even in the face of opposition, we hold true, we remain firm, and they won't be able to ignore it. When I was in college, I had a dear friend who was a young man by the name of Jake. And Jake was a big hunter. And one day, Jake invited me to go out and go duck hunting with him. Now, I had never been duck hunting. I had been bird hunting. So I knew the basic mechanics, but I'd never actually gone duck hunting. So we got up early one morning before the sun had risen. The dew was still on the grass. And we huddled down in this blind on the edge of a body of water. We lower this camouflage canopy down over us and the sun began to rise over the water and for three hours we sat and waited for a duck. Now the entire morning went by and my hands eventually went numb and my teeth began to chatter and then finally on the horizon comes one lone duck. And so my friend Jake throws open the blind and he jumps up and fires all three rounds into the sky at this duck. And the duck began to boldly fly on to his destination. And my friend, looking down at me still in the blind, because I had yet to even respond, he hits me on the arm and he says, you know what, brother, we just saw a miracle. There is a dead duck still flying in the sky. And I hit him on the shoulder and I said, well, on that note, let's go home. (laughs) We could have gotten up out of that blind and been defeated and said, you know what? We never even got a duck. We could have gone home and said, well, that was a waste of our time. What good was that? But his confidence, his joy was infectious. And so we got up out of that blind that day and we went home and smiled because we had a good time. You know what, as a church, even if we face opposition, even if we face persecution, we can count it a joy. And as we are confident together in the gospel message, it is my prayer that that confidence would move into your family, that it would move into your life and into your place of employment, and the world will take note. Let's take the confidence of the gospel with us as we go. Let us not just sing great songs as we stand in this room. Let us not pray bold prayers as we gather as a church, but let's take the confidence of the gospel and let's take it into our community. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for its richness and its greatness. We thank you for the truth that we are saved through Christ Jesus. And Father, I pray that you would restore to the church its confidence. Father, I pray specifically for us as First Baptist Church, I pray that you would give us a boldness and that you would remind us of the power of the Spirit, that that power lives in us. And Father, I pray that we would not be timid, that we would stand firm on the truth and that we would draw encouragement and strength from one another as we seek to do that which you've called us to do, to share the gospel to the ends of the earth. I ask all this in Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen.